Welcome, everyone. Byron here. Glad to be with everyone today, your host. And I'm here with Kathy. Kathy, welcome. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. We're happy that you're here, and we're also happy that you're going to be a speaker at Content Marketing Conference. So thanks for that. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. (laughs) Congratulations. Some some fireworks should be going off over your your office right now. (laughs) (laughs) They are. So... We're we're gonna we're gonna dive right in uh, in a few house rules uh, perhaps before we start. For starters, I'm I'm calling you from ad tech, everyone. That's kind of sort of exciting. Uh, we had a fun party uh, last night with with customers. Wow, there's a couple of uh, fun shots here. <laughs> Whoa, that's uh, that's us in Times Square hand, handing out copies of my book to Mickey Mouse and the family there. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And there's some funky or funky new booth uh, design. Uh, that we're debuting the designer access, another model similar to writer access. We're getting some feedback from customers and put a test drive up there. So those are a couple of the shots. So yeah, ad tech is interesting. Just a quick note on that. Um, I haven't been to this show in two or three years and uh, it's a little bit smaller uh, than it, than I remember it being years ago, but it's packed with some great companies. To me, it feels like no longer ad tech. It's now it's tech tech. Uh, so many <laughs> analytics analytics companies uh, are here. Uh, you know, uh, really, it feels very, very analytically driven this year. I guess that makes sense. The technology part of, of, of ad tech, uh, but it is exciting. It's bustling. It's it's uh, really we had a crazy day yesterday, and a really fun party at Death Avenue Brewery. How about that, Kathy? That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> It was a really funky place um, down near Wall Street that was uh, uh, had a, a big, wonderful, open, aired uh, uh, event space in the back of the space with couches and funky and bamboo on the walls, and we just had a beautiful evening. It was probably 65 degrees, uh, unusual for November, so we had a, a great uh, group of about 30 customers and writers and fans and prospects and uh, great people uh, that they came out. We had a wonderful evening. But but we're super excited uh, to just let you know. Uh, Kate, maybe you can skip over to the, yeah. the bullet so point me, list there. Yeah, uh, go, go over ahead. a couple yep. of housekeeping items. So we're here today for how to consistently create unforgettable content with improv comedy um, with Writer Access and Kathy Klotz Guest of Keeping It Human. And um, just a few housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar. We are sending an email with that recording inside to everybody who registered uh, tomorrow morning, so check your inboxes for that. We'll have some time for Q&A, and we are um, having a live Twitter chat with the hashtag right on. So we'll be sharing slides, um, um, taking questions through Twitter, and tweeting funny quotes and pictures as we go. So definitely uh, participate with us over there. I'll put that in the chat for everyone to share. Um, so today I'll be acting as a host, uh, moderating any questions from the attendees. And um, we're very thrilled to have uh, the expert speaker, Kathy Kloss, get Clothes guest here. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get that right. It's so sorry. Kathy Clothes guest, creator of keepingithuman.com, storyteller, speaker, comic improviser, which is what we're some skills we're going to be learning from today. Um, host of Jargoneria Live, which I just love that name. I love how creative you are, Kathy, and I'm really excited to share that with our audience. Um, host of Story DNA video series and your co author an upcoming book on business storytelling. So you have got a lot going on. On top of all of this, speaking at our conference uh, next May, which we couldn't be more thrilled about. Um, so we're, we're very, very happy to have you here um, and don't want to take up too much more time um, and, and dive right into the content. Um, we'll start by asking just a couple uh, questions of our audience, and you guys can throw your answers in the chat box. How do you brainstorm new ideas for content marketing? Do you chat with a colleague, conduct internet research, hold full-blown whiteboard meetings with your whole team over pizza, talk maybe to yourself, or do something else. So chat us what you do to um, brainstorm for new content ideas. We'd love to learn. Um, Kathy, how do you usually do your brainstorming? 
You know, I like to get out of the normal course of brainstorming because I think what happens over time is um, we're so used to seeing things the same way and using the same techniques that our, our brains no longer see what's fresh and new. So I like to mix it up and use some improv techniques and first get people laughing because laughter is um, the conduit for creativity. And so that's a yeah. big part of how I, I approach it. Awesome. And um, my our next question for you guys is, have you ever seen an improv show before in person or in TV? Or are you lucky enough to have some improv training? I know my, I did some of that as when I was growing up and absolutely loved it. And I think it's what um, you know helped me uh, speak publicly or even just in a team and come up with new ideas and, and write better. And you would never expect it to apply those ways. But um, so hopefully some of our audience uh, it, it's the same for you. Um, but I'm going to hand over the uh, control to you now, Kathy, and um, dive right into your content. Perfect. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. And I, I really um, I can't wait to share some great information with you. And I want, I want us to have fun today because improv comedy, if nothing else, is about fun fun and creativity. So we're going to play. Um, again, um, Kate gave out the hashtag. If you want to uh, tweet about it, it's uh, hashtag right on, no space between right and on. And I am at Kathy Klotz Guest. And uh, yay, Kate, because she got it right. Those tricky German names. So she got it right. <laughs> and All right. Kathy, would you have a chance? Go ahead and share your screen. We're not seeing the slides yet. You're not seeing it. OK. Yes, we should be seeing it. Um, hmm, okay, that's not showing it. Hmm. Let me see why that's happening here. I'm not, uh, let's see here. Okay, it I'm says waiting to view Kathy. So I think there should be a, a, an accept button that popped up on your screen. Um, <clears throat> to there, there is, but it is not allowing me to click on it from my, um, from my, computer so it is not letting me click on it you know yeah. what I will go ahead oh did you get it it is not working no do you want to go ahead and control it yeah. that's fine I'll, we'll just... I'll control it from my screen so just uh, uh, let me know when you need me to click ahead to the next slide perfect yeah let's go to the next slide um, let's yeah all right are these displaying for everybody go ahead and chat us in if yes. the slides are looking yep. good Everything's great, great. All right, we're ready for you, Kathy. Okay, yeah, it's not showing on my, on mine, so I'm going to have to just forward my own slides on my computer, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. The rule number one about oh, improv comedy, <laughs> I just learned rule number one about improv comedy, and that is be adaptable. <laughs> that is the first rule. Um, so, you know, that first image there, I, I want us all today to really um, get grounded in our inner child. That's me at five. That's a picture of me. And I want you to really, um, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just really, really have fun. Because improv isn't about trying to force the funny. It's about having fun. And your inner child is an expert on having fun. We know that. So um, if you can unleash your inner child, you're good to go today. All right, next slide, Kate. All right. Why improv comedy? <laughs> Why improv comedy? Well, here's the thing about improv is improv and all comedy are about the truth. I would say that again. Comedy is the truth because the truth is funny. And all you're doing is you're taking that truth and you're heightening it. And you're taking it to a really fun place. So I like to say that comedy is the truth on steroids because there's that kernel of truth we all recognize, that universal truth that makes us laugh. And improv is fundamentally about playfulness. And, you know, Kate asked the question, have any of you ever seen an improv show? And I, I'm sure that many of you have. Um, or at least you've heard of, if not watched, whose line is it anyway? And one of the things that's really fundamental that improvisers learn early on is that we have to be playful and accept each other's offers. And we have to work together as a collaborative team. And if your goal is to be funny, um, I would say try stand-up <laughs> because improv is so much about unleashing that playful side. And I know that everybody listening now 
can be playful because your inner child was made to be playful. So we're going to unleash some playfulness and creativity. And if you focus on that, the fun comes out of the playfulness. I promise you that. All right. Next slide there, Kate. There you go. Humor and comedy. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about humor and comedy. Humor and comedy, why they work, before we get into some exercises, Humor and comedy, I, I really want us to understand that humor and comedy disrupt expected patterns. That's what they do. Why does it work? Why is humor so great? And why does it work so well? Because we didn't see it coming. If, if I expect one thing from a company and they do something completely different, <clears throat> it's brilliant. And it has a way of... of letting us see something fresh. So when our brain is just ready to just dismiss something, humor stops that pattern and reawakens our, our attention span. And that is why humor is so darn effective. And I like to say it raises the emotional stakes because it means people re-engage. Because humor is a fundamentally human visceral response. People say, well, what did you think? Did you think that was funny? And it's not about thinking. It's visceral. Something's either funny and made you laugh or it didn't. That is an emotional response. And that is the best way to connect with your audience emotionally. All right. Next slide, Kate. Over there. <laughs> I feel like I have my own Vanna White today. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, technology is great till it stops working. <clears throat> so today, we're going to talk about the principles, key principles of improv comedy and how it al allows us to, to go to these unexpected places. Humor and comedy disrupt the pattern because it's unexpected. I didn't expect that. Oh my God, that's funny. And when we think about why, why things can be so effective, it's because it took us to an unexpected place. So we're going we're gonna to practice playfulness today. We're going to talk about techniques. There's five different principles that I'm going to talk about from improv comedy. Now, there's many more. There's not just five. Um, but there's so much more. That's a whole other webinar. And I figure for this first one, we won't, we won't sort of uh, c commit the crime of deluging everybody with, uh, with improv. But, but I, I picked the five that I think are really, um, in my experience, represent a lot of the heart and soul of what improv comedy is about. So we'll talk about things like yes and, and contrast, and status, and mashups, and all these different techniques. And we're going to demonstrate a couple of them with Byron's help. And the key thing here is not only can you generate fresh, fun content, you will be able to use these techniques back at work to come up with new ideas for products and services, business models, and fresh content. Because these techniques are very robust and they're just tons of fun. So the key thing here, anyone can be creative using improv. And I have a saying, I think today safe is the new risky. So if you, you do things the same way you've always done it, you're going to get the same results that everybody else is going to get. Safe is the new risky. You can't afford to play it safe. So let's have some fun and jump in and do some different stuff. That's what I say. All right, Kate. There you go. All right. I feel like I have my own chauffeur. <laughs> um, yes, and. All right, number one. One of the key principles of improv is yes, and. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard this before. It is, it is the fundamental precept of which all around all other other principles of improv really um, uh, lie. It's the foundation. And the reason it's the cornerstone is because the way that scenes are built on a stage with fellow improvisers is that somebody makes an offer. And I accept that. If somebody comes on stage and says, hey mom, you know, uh, I really wish you wouldn't yell at my baseball games anymore. I can't say, well, I'm not your mom. No. You have said that I'm your mom, and I am your mom in that scene. So I am going to yes and that, I accept that, and I build onto it. And yes and is a very powerful way to generate ideas with people. And here's a couple things about yes and I always like to say. Now, in a brainstorming session, no matter what method you use for brainstorming, you're not always going to have, you know, ideas that are viable. And, 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 you know, it's not about that. You're exploring. And it doesn't mean that just because you generate a bunch of ideas with yes and that you have to go write a check to do those ideas. Right? You don't have to, 
you know, you're not putting a ring on the finger of, of that idea. You're just taking it out for a good time and a couple of drinks. That's what you're doing. You're just exploring. And exploring is a very power, powerful creative process. And yes and is the fundamental of how those scenes are built. So, all right. Next slide, Kate. There you go. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I feel like I should tip, we should tip, at least I should tip Kate at the end of this. <laughs> so so what, what about yes and? Well, before we demonstrate it here, yes and ex is about exaggerating, taking something to a place of total comedy. Why does comedy make us laugh? Because we're taking that kernel of truth, and, we're, and comedy is the truth on steroids, and we're taking it over the top. So we're exaggerating and taking it to this crazy place, um, whether it's, it's a pain that my customer has, or it's just a goofy thing that we recognize to be true. Um, we're just completely heightening. And yes and, when we yes and each other on stage, allows us to completely heighten. Um, if you'll remember the Blendtec ads um, from years ago, that was crazy heightening. It was like one week they would, the Blendtec blender folks would, you know, blend uh, something reasonable like an ad. Apple. And then pretty soon it was ratcheted up to next week on Blend Tech. Will it blend? We're going to blend an iPad. Will it blend? I don't know, but I'm sure it's not going to tune in to find out because that's crazy. <laughs> so we're just going to ratchet up. Um, but it's a really beautiful gift to give, and it's a great brainstorming technique. Um, next slide, Kate. There you go. All right. Um, an example of this, um, and we're going to give a couple examples, and then I'm going to uh, we're going to do an activity. Uh, the mayhem, the mayhem ads that you see from Allstate. This is a great example of, of yes ending and heightening and, and exaggeration. I mean, it's crazy. All these scenarios that the uh, that the embodiment, the, the personification of mayhem, this this actor takes, it's hysterical. Now imagine these crazy scenarios. One of my favorite scenarios is is the he pretends to be the teenage girl that just got broken up with with their boyfriend, and he's driving the pink truck, and now he's just gotten bad news, and he's behind the wheel, and he's emotionally compromised. So so he's hitting all the cars in the parking lot, <laughs> and it's a very funny scenario. Now it's funny because it hasn't happened to us, um, and nobody gets hurt. That's why we can laugh. But it's just this comical thing because we know that the kernel of truth is when you're emotionally compromised. Yeah, you're not at your best when you're driving, and the scenario just kind of ratchets up where you can already take somebody who's a teenager, maybe not a great driver, and then we're just ratcheting up the crazy, and that's why it's really effective. All right, next slide. Adobe, there you go. Adobe. Adobe has a really good, for B2B people, I don't want to leave you out. Um, some of you folks are probably in B2C and in the consumer space. Some of you are going to be in the B2B space. Um, Adobe, um, I really applaud them for trying to experiment and do some fun things. And they have this great video um, around their product called, the, the product is the Adobe Marketing Cloud. And they have this video called The Launch, and it just cracks me up. <laughs> Every time this guy who's pictured here, the protagonist, is he's about to launch um, some kind of rocket. So you know we don't know if it's a it's a communication satellite or if it's it's you know supposedly NASA, whatever. But every time there's this launch, the launch gets interrupted by somebody getting a call from their analytics uh, uh, station. The analytics uh, 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 stop the uh, analytics says that customers want this now. They just about to hit that button, then another call comes in, and like ten different calls come in. And he's like, what now? It's like it's constantly. <laughs> it's constant interrupt, but that's the way business works, is you're constantly interrupted, and your customers, um, they want different things, and having analytics that helps you understand that is a very powerful thing, but it's very funny. Because you can imagine this take it, this extreme just building up. By the end, the guy's like, are we going to do this or what? <laughs> so it's a very funny video that, not now, but at some other time, you can go watch that video. <clears throat> All right. Next slide. Smartphone. Oh, I love this. This is so funny. All right. <laughs> now, this is a good one. This is a great way to start, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna model it, and then I'm gonna ask Byron to join me. Um, now, you can yes and just take an idea and start to yes and, and I'll I'll demonstrate it here in a second. Um, another thing that I like to do to jumpstart a creative process with yes and is I like to just get people out of thinking about things in the normal way. So what I will do is I'll say, all right, before we yes and, let's Let's just not start brainstorming with, hey, what should we add to our product? Because now we're looking at our product in the same way we always do. I like to put a product out of context, and I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides more in depth. But for right now, 
I sometimes like to say, all right, let's let's take your product, if it's a physical product, even if it's software, and let's let's use it for something that it wasn't designed for. So um, we're for for purpose of, of illustrating um, a way to use yes and in heightening. Let's say for the sake of argument that we are uh, a smartphone manufacturer. So you know Samsung, Apple, pick your pick, <laughs> whatever you choose, and we are going to put it to another use. And I, I too, Kate, love that picture because it's adorable. And we're going to use it for something it wasn't designed for. So what's what's something? I'll ask for a suggestion. What's something that you can use a smartphone? for that is not a smartphone and if nobody comes hockey with puck a hockey puck perfect that's perfect all right now let's assume that it's a hockey puck now I'm gonna ask Byron to join me here's what we're gonna do we're gonna assume that our goal is to generate new ideas for content maybe new product ideas to brainstorm using yes and so I'm gonna start assuming that that smartphone is a hockey puck and everything that I say is going to, um, uh, Byron's going to jump in and yes and. He's going to yes and everything that I say and he's going to add, the key thing is he's going to add on to what I said. He's going to add another feature. And then I'm going to yes and and add on another feature. So are you ready, Byron? Um, I think so. I might be the dumb guy on the smartphone <laughs> problem here, but sure. <laughs> We're all smart. That's the beautiful thing with creativity. We're all smart. So let's start assuming it's a hockey puck, and we're smartphone manufacturers. So I'll say it's a hockey puck, um, and and we're going to add in um, maps that show customers where the best hockey arenas are in the country. Now you're going to yes and and add something onto that. Yes, and we're going to eliminate some of those hockey rinks because you're probably a little too far away to get to some of them. Mm. And we're going to show you not only the, the hockey rinks that are, with, are within a reasonable mile radius from your house, we're going to show you the ones that have the best food. Now you had, yes, and And... Yeah. And yes, that is true. <laughs> and the puck itself may be edible if you're really hungry. Ooh, and not only will it be edible, but we're going to put inside the edible puck, we're going to have cameras that will show you what happens to your food when you digest it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if you don't like hockey, you don't have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't like Does, hockey, hockey, we will build in a feature that will show you other products that other people who don't like hockey bought. <laughs> And if you are not happy, we will give you your money back. Perfect. All right. Now, here's here's the fun thing about that is that now there's some silly ideas that are going to get generated here, and that's what yes and is about. We are not going to have uh, there is no brainstorming process that I've ever used that will always 100% of the time have every idea be viable, and that's not the point. Is let's step back and look at some of the ideas that came out of this. If I'm a smartphone manufacturer, I just came up with some really interesting ideas for content. If I may, let's break this down. Now, what if you discovered that you know a percent of your uh, um, uh, buyers are sports fans and they love hockey? Now, what if you actually created some kind of app or some kind of content that actually gave your audience a way to find not only hockey rinks, but junior hockey rinks where their kids could take lessons? Where hockey rinks where they had gourmet food. Maybe you've got some gourmet uh, people who love hockey in your in your customer base. Um, maybe you give a um, uh, some kind of walkie map um, or some kind of content with around that. What's around the hockey rink in your area? Points of interest. You start to get ideas that are a little bit start out with a kernel of like whoa and go well. What could we do with that? So you're starting to generate other ideas. Now, if I came at this and I just said, hey, Byron, we're a smart mode manufacturer. What other things, what kind of content should we build? What, what should we create? What other content should we create? 
I'm pretty darn sure, I'm willing to bet 99.9% .9 of the time, Byron and I would not have even thought about hockey. We would not have probably come up with walkie maps. We would not have come up with this idea of cameras that you might digest, of uh, hockey rinks, um, a way to talk about hockey rinks in your local area. None of that stuff would have surfaced because we weren't yes anding each other and just accepting and building on to this crazy place. So the key thing is don't yes but any of the ideas. You can do this by yourself. You can do this with your team. You're ex just yes and everything as if it's, it's it's a beautiful gift because out of that you're going to get some very viable ideas that you can explore for some really interesting content. So make sense? All right. Um, totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and, ha and it's fun. It's fun, and it's a fun way to come up with different ideas. So again, the only rule: no yet, no yes, buddy. Because a yes, but my friends is just a no walking around in cheap perfume and costume jewelry, and it doesn't work, and people shut down. So yes, and that's the fundamental um, principle. All right, next one, uh, Kate. Next slide. There you go. Make your partner look good. Make your partner look good. Oh, this is such an important thing. Now, the one thing I didn't do in all these slides, and I will tell you, is that listening is fundamental. It's a fundamental concept. There's no way Byron and I can generate the ideas that we do if we're not listening to each other. Because yes and says, I take your idea and build on it. Listening is an uh, undercurrent in all the principles I'm going to talk about today. And the same with the second principle, make your partner look good. Well, what, I, what do I mean by that? A fundamental principle of improv comedy is to put the focus on your partner. So if Byron comes in and makes a choice, or Kate makes a choice, and say, you know, and says, "Hey, um, you know what? Um, your boss called and you're fired," then I accept that as fact and I build onto that. That's the fact we have in the scene. I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say, "Are you sure?" That's fact. And I'm going to make my partner look good. I'm always going to say every idea that my partner puts on the stage is brilliant. Um, next slide, Kate. There you go. Thank you. So what that means is this. When I put the focus on my partner, it's not about how brilliant I am when I walk onto that improv comedy stage. It's about how do I make my fellow players look good. And here's how you apply this. What does it mean to content marketing? How do I make my audience look good? How do I either co-create with them or allow them to be the focus and take my brand and their experience with my brand and create user-generated content that I highlight on my site. How do I make them look smart and good? And here's some really, really great examples. Um, I love Lay's. And some of you listening to this right now may have entered their contest. Every year they do a contest where whoever comes up with the craziest flavor, you know, it goes to a vote and they actually make that flavor. But this is a beautiful thing because then that person gets credit for it, they make the flavor, they win a prize, they get all kinds of um, trust for it, it works for Lay's. And they're basically saying, thank you, fans. Thank you for having great, you know, co-creating this with us and coming up with your ideas. It's a great way to, to put the spotlight on your fans. Um, that bottom one with the baby, that's from a Super Bowl uh, commercial, Go, the GoPro uh, uh, dubstep baby. GoPro has some of the best user-generated content around. Want to see a good example? GoPro, because they know that people buy their cameras, not because they necessarily love cameras, but because they're documenting their life. And they want to share those moments of their lives with other people. So if you want to make your partner look good, highlight those videos. There's tons of great content that GoPro highlights, and it's all about their users. And how do they make their users look good and better and live their lives? Great example. Um, Jones Soda, Jones makes some funky flavors. Um, they make some ones that make you go, huh? Like um, mashed potatoes and gravy and all this stuff around the holidays. They do that kind of stuff. Um, but they also allow you to make your own custom label. And they want you to design Jones Soda your way. What would that look like? So how can I offer a chance to co-create with my, my partner? And by doing that, put the focus of my content on my partner. Uh, next slide there, Kate. There you go. 
uh, Red Bull. Red Bull does a great job of this. Red Bull has these um, great uh, events. Um, uh, one of them is Rampage, and they bring these extreme kind of bicyclists and all this stuff um, to do their thing. It's not about Red Bull. It's not about the product. It's about the lives that people are living. And it's a great way to then put the focus on these amazing athletes and enthusiasts that do this adventurous, brave, bold stuff. And that's the focus, not Red Bull. And it's, it's uh, you know, they, they, they um, I think Red Bull does a really great job of that, um, as does GoPro. Uh, next slide. Tough photo. Tough Mudder. Tough Mudder. I don't know how many of you have heard of Tough Mudder. But Tough Mudder is, I think, a brilliant thing. They're an endurance um, kind of race, obstacle course thing, and they have them all over the country. And people sign up with their friends or their family, and they test their endurance to see what they're really made of. And I see bumper stickers all the time. It's a badge of honor. I did the Tough Mudder course. And they allow the community to upload their own photos, and they highlight all the Tough Mudders out there who go and they see what they're made of, and nothing tests your endurance like a Tough Mudder competition. And it's not about, hey, you know, us, we're Tough Mudder. It's you guys are Tough Mudders. We're, we're all Tough Mudders together. And most of the stuff on their site really highlights and makes their customers look good. So, you know, Figure out a way to do that, and your customers will love you because they want to champion your brand. They'll also share more of those photos and the content that they're creating because they created it. So that's really important. All right, next slide, Kate. <laughs> the Mona, Mona Lisa. <laughs> All right, I, I, we will be fun and colorful, if nothing else. Uh, the, we talked about this, putting the focus on your partner. That's number two. The third principle of improv, um, I think, is really important is contrast. Comedy is all about contrast. So um, in a scene, if somebody is really quiet, um, then a person who joins that person on stage is going to be probably loud and have high volume. So you have a contrast of characters on the stage. And contrast is beautiful for comedy. It's all about the unexpected. It's about incongruities, things that don't fit, a clash of contexts. You know, it's the fish out of water concept that you've heard of. You know, think about movies like Big or Splash or Kindergarten Cop. What does a cop know? A hardened cop, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, know about teaching little kindergartners. He doesn't really know much. That's crazy. <laughs> Why would you put that guy in charge of a kindergarten class? Because the comedy comes out of seeing people in a context that is not their normal environment. So a contrast is a great way of thinking about fun content and generating new bold ideas. Um, next slide, Kate. So, some examples. Here's some examples. Um, some of my favorite examples of, of contrast, where you know it's it's very fun, is um, I'll start with the right hand side because dogs are cute. Um, one of my favorite campaigns last year was a bunch of videos and images and blog posts from the uh, Humane Society of Silicon Valley, and they did a campaign called Eddie the Terrible, and it was all about this dog who was having trouble getting adopted because he bit people. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of a jerky dog. And what was beautiful about it is that it was a redemption story. We, we tend to anthropomorphize animals, but there's something beautiful about that because what human being doesn't need redemption every now and again, right? We all need to be redeemed. And so um, it's a beautiful redemption story. They were very honest about it. They felt like, gosh, you know what? He's having trouble getting adopted. He bites people. We should just call it what it is. He's kind, he's kind of a crappy dog, but even crappy dogs deserve a second chance. So they put him in all these really funny scenarios. They whole content campaign around, like, what if he were Walt, like in like Breaking Bad? We'll call it Adopting Bad. <laughs> and then, what if he was an American Horror Story? Because he bites people. And let's do that. Um, and so they'd have these funny images and blog posts, and they did a couple of videos with him in these different scenarios, and it was very successful. And not only did it get you know millions of views, but Eddie the ter uh, the terrible and hap happy to say uh, was adopted, and I think he works as kind of a therapy dog, if you can believe that. Um, so last I talked to the Humane Society of Silicon Valley in my neck of the woods, um, he's doing great. But they were very honest about it. You know, he's a dog that bites people. So if you got kids, keep walking. Eddie's not for you. If you think he's going to be loving and you know easy to handle, keep walking. He's not for you. And their refreshing honesty and putting him in all these scenarios was just a big hit. So contrast. 
contrast. Um, on the left-hand side, um, you've all seen the um, um, Sprint commercials with James Earl Jones and Malcolm McDowell, where they read texts from 13-year-old girls. Oh my God, adorbs! It's toast my goats. And it's hysterical because you've got these actors that have these tremendous um, stage accomplishments and movie accomplishments, and they're reading these texts from 13-year-old girls. It's so out of character. It's so funny. And they're wearing tuxedos when they say it. It's just hysterical. So how can you how can you do that with your own products or services? How can you create contrast? And we'll talk more in a second. And of course, who can not love Betty White? Betty White is she's the queen of comedy. And in those Snickers commercials where you know the coach uh, is hungry, he hasn't you know he's got an empty stomach, so it's Betty White's tackling people on the football field. <laughs> And it's just such great fun to see Betty White anytime, um, but she's tackling people, and Snickers does a really good job with that. All right, next slide, Kate. There you go. All right. So um, there's a couple ways to do this for yourself. How can you change the normal course of discourse about your product or services or your content? If your content always talks about X, what would be unusual? Um, how, do, how do we take your product or services or, or company and put it in a completely different context? So there's a couple ways to do that. Um, one thing you could try is to put your um, product in a, a different time period. What would people do with it? What would they think it is? Um, imagine putting your product, if you had a software product in, you know, with the cavemen, you know, you, Geico does this with, you know, they've done a couple cavemen things with, you know, it's very funny. What would people think about your product? What would they do with it? <laughs> um, put it in the future, kind of a la Mystery Science Theater 3000, you had a bunch of robots um, talking about your product, how would they describe it? What would they know it is? Um, you know, if you've got a product that is about to make another product obsolete, what if you had a ther you know, some kind of therapy group for obsolete products? What would those products talk about? Um, the main thing here is, is to take whatever your product is or whatever you have been talking about normally day to day and completely do something unexpected, put it in a completely different you know, contrasting situation. What would be a clash of contexts? What if you, you know, there was a celebrity who knew nothing about, you know, uh, your product and all of a sudden tried to endorse it, but they didn't understand it? Um, if you had a very sophisticated product for millennials, what would happen if, you know, your grandparents tried to explain it? <laughs> well, you can imagine the humor will naturally come out of that. So. Use contrast. Contrast is your comedy friend. It's also a way to come up with some amazing, amazing ideas. All right, Kate, next slide. All right. Um, Batman, there you go. Batman and Legos, mashups. Mashups, mashups are kind of taking the contrast idea that I just mentioned and sort of just, you know, taking a new spin on it. Um, our brains like mashups. Mashups take what's expected and again, flip that model upside down. and. Comedy, a lot of comedy just naturally unfolds when we mash up different ideas um, because we're not, our brains are not used to seeing things that look different but all of a sudden mixed together. Although I will say that my, my husband and my son said, um, okay, mashups are great, just don't mix your Marvel and DC universes. So I was corrected on this. <laughs> but of course, I'm liberated from that because I really don't know those universes. So there you go. Um, we like mashups. Um, next slide there, Kate. There you go. All right. So there's a couple ways to think about mashups. Um, you know who's really good at this? BuzzFeed. If you want to look at an example of a, a company that takes different pieces of content and mashes them up and sees things that are trending, go to BuzzFeed and do a mashup. Um, one thing that I really liked is one day I was looking at BuzzFeed and, and things about dogs and cats and pets were really trending. Marketing. Lessons from marketing were trending. How about a mashup? Like, you know, lessons I learned about marketing from my dog. Or you know why my cat doesn't kill me in my sleep, but uh, and here's the lesson, here's the content marketing lessons out of that. So there's a lot of different ways to take these training topics and again put put those together and find those similar veins. Content Marketing Institute has done this, and they did this really fun example with a couple different infographics and a blog post just recently. And they, they talked about you now how is how is you know content marketing like the Beatles, and they found some amazing facts and they created some content around that. And I thought not only was it was it brilliant, it was very fun. And they've done this before. They've taken different things and again just mashed them up. 
if you're Uber or you're Lyft or you're some kind of ride sharing service, here's an example. Um, I, I was doing a, um, a uh, kind of facilitation for, for a company and, and they were looking at ride sharing and, and what they discovered was a big part of their audience has pets and is crazy about pets. Well, what if you did a mashup of these different um, likes and different uh, passions that your audience has and put those together and they came up with what about pet ride sharing so like your pet has to get to a pet birthday party what if it was ride sharing for pets <laughs> now you're not going to create a service around this you might but imagine the content imagine creating some very fun videos if you know your uber or your lyft and you actually got, got people your employees to bring their pets to work and you actually did a very funny video around that um, you know, that could be a fresh way to talk about what you do. And, you know, good thing people aren't pets. Have some fun with it. Do something completely different. It's a blog post, it's a video, whatever, an infographic. But get out of the normal way of thinking about your content. So here's the key thing with this kind of mashup before we move on is take your service. There's two ways you can do this. You can take your service and combine it with something dissimilar, like like you know pet ride sharing take ride sharing your service and combine it with something dissimilar like pets or take a passion that you guys have at your company and meld it with a passion of your audience in the case of GoPro it's people like being mobile um, people don't miss they don't exist to buy your cameras but a big passion that that audience has is they like being on the road there isn't a day that goes by where I'm not driving by my house in Silicon Valley where I don't see a motorcyclist with a GoPro camera and you probably see it too so find a way to take what they're passionate about and ma ma do a mashup with, with what your product or service is or what you're, you're, you're passionate about so a lot of great ideas alright Kate next slide there you go. <laughs> all right. I know. I, I just feel spoiled. I wish Kate could come with me to all my meetings. <laughs> um, I, I would have a blast. You've never made me laugh so much at a webinar. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I'm so glad. Well, the final thing I want to talk about today, and again, listening is such a part of all these things, and listening is fundamental to improv comedy. Listen to what your audience says they want, what their passions are. Um, the fifth thing I'm going to talk about today, and again, there's so many more principles of improv, but I've, we're limited on how much time we have. And that is status shifts and role reversals. In improv comedy, we want to see by the end of a scene that something has changed. Somebody or multiple people have changed. Because we're not emotionally satisfied unless that happens. So, for example, if there's a scene where a person starts out high status, like maybe they're a know-it-all and they're a jerk and they think they have all the answers, by the end of that, that improv scene, I want to see that person taken down a peg or two. Maybe they switch places with the janitor. And a high status character goes to a lower status character, um, but that lower status character has integrity, right? So lower status doesn't mean, you know, that they're they're lacking in integrity. It just means that, you know, we we look at CEOs a certain way, we look at people who are admins a certain way. Uh, is it fair? I don't know. That's life. But the thing is, is that we want to see somebody who maybe is a high status character who's jerking, taking down a few pegs. And like, you're, you know, the boss, if the CEO is a jerk, we want to see that shift by the end of the scene. If somebody is, you know, a, a good-hearted, high-integrity person like a janitor, and there ain't anything wrong with that, earning an honest living, maybe that person becomes the CEO by the end of the scene. We want to see that person elevated because they're a good person, and we're like rooting for that person. And so you get the point. And role reversals work. By the end of an improv scene, maybe the husband and the wife have, have switched roles. Role reversals are inherently funny. Um, and there's this this image right here is taken from a very funny song called "Girl in a in a in a Country Song," where um, uh, you know the two women who wrote the song were tired of women being depicted a certain way all the time. So they said, "Well, what if men in country songs had to dress like that? They would probably write different songs." So the song is very funny, but it illustrates the point that again, you don't have to try to be funny, but status shifts and role reversals, the humor will just spill out of that. Um, next slide. Yep, there you go. All right, think about undercover boss. That's a really great example of a status shift. I mean, you know, it's and most of the, the times the costumes are really bad and people already figure out who they are. <laughs> but that's not the point. It's a great example of of the comedy comes out of it because you take this person who's a high status character, you put him in a regular kind of position that isn't as high status in the company, and 
and watch them struggle a little bit. They find out things they never knew that their employees had to deal with, and it's very humbling. It's a very humbling experience, but great stuff comes out of that. Um, I did a talk um, at, at uh, uh, another conference earlier in the year, and I talked about how one way to, to do a very funny kind of status shift or role reversal is to have kids explain technology products. Kids have a BS filter, man, that is so finely tuned. You ever try to explain what you do to your kid? Those of you that have kids, and let me tell you something, your seven-year-old, is if they don't understand it, they're going to call you out on it. You start using jargon, they're going to go, uh-uh, I don't get it. And so if you can't pass the sniff test with your kid, you know your, 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 your message is not good. And I talked about that. And one of the things that there was a bunch of people there from LinkedIn, and they went and took some of these ideas and did some funny stuff with it. Um, next slide, Kate. Yep. So what they did is they, they did a couple different things. They, they took that to heart, and they actually did this kind of campaign, um, hashtag describe my job to a five-year-old, and it was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and they had these, these, this kid's probably weren't five, but they had these little kids read their parents' resume, their online LinkedIn profile, and these kids were hilarious because they're like reading these things going, I don't even know what you do. What does mom and dad do? I, well, I don't even know what this is. And it's, the comedy comes out of just the beauty of a role reversal or a status shift. Um, you're going to have fun with it. So you want a great way to create content? Um, next slide there, Kate. Um, yep, your turn. Here's, your turn. Here's some great ideas for you to take, take back to the ranch. Have your kids or your customers explain your product in their words. And I'm telling you, I've done this for my business, I've done this for clients, and it's hysterical. Because your kids, if you start using words like paradigm shifting and, you know, um, revolutionary and best of breed, your kids are going to laugh at you. <laughs> They're not going to understand it. Imagine creating a video, and I've done this, and it's very funny, and it works really well. But it changes the conversation about your product. LinkedIn also did a very funny video where they actually um, had people trying to explain what they did to their parents. Now, your parents are looking at you, or your grandparents are looking at you like, I have no idea what this is, a social media strategist. What the heck is that? T tell me what you really do. Very funny. Um, the other thing you can do is have customers run your company. Do a little bit of a, of a kind of an undercover boss thing. Um, invite them in for an hour or two and, and video it. Ask them, what would you build? What would you create? What would you do differently? And we did this. Um, my company did this for a credit union. We actually asked a bunch of millennials to come in for lunch, bought them lunch. What, if you ran the credit union, what would you do differently? And they did some very hilarious things. And we videoed it. And we're getting ready to launch some campaigns to millennials based on what we videoed. So it's a great way to have some fun and come up with new content. Um, have your executives switch places with customers and employees. It'll be humbling and eye-opening, uh, not only for your executive, but for the employee too. Because the, the comedy that comes out of that will just be very natural and very organic. You don't have to force anything. So um, another friend, um, again, in Improv Comedy 5 um, principle, your friend, status shifts and role reversals are your friends. Uh, next slide. Yep. Just play. I, I, really, that's the best advice I can give you. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of things today. We talked about yes anding and exaggerating. It's a great tool to use. Number two, make your partner look good. Always make your partner look good. How can you do that with your customers? Contrast. Um, take your product and service or your content and put it in a different experience. Um, Mashups. How can I create, take content pieces that seemingly are dissimilar and mash them up and see something fresh in that mashup. And then status and role reversals. Just play. When you, when you play and you're playful with your content, you will go to some really amazing unexpected places. <clears throat> that's, and that's it. Next slide. And And people will get the slides, Kate, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything other than, um, uh, you know, this is a little bit about me and people can read it on their own. I'm a storyteller, an improviser, um, a, a, a creative officer, and there you go. What a fantastic presentation today, really, uh, really uplifting and, uh, and, and confidence building when it comes to being funny and crazy and witty and, 
and uh, advancing things. I have some questions for you, uh, and then we'll turn things over to Kate that, that's fielding some questions from, from some other people. My first question is, why do we get so serious with our ideas and lose the ability to laugh or be creative? Why does that happen? I think a lot of it happens because um, we've we've squeezed the fun out of brainstorming and all of a sudden because we have a business outcome we have to create new products and services or we have to create new content because there is a serious business objective that we attach to it we think that the methodology has to be serious too and we become so gosh darn serious and the reality is is that um, I know from 20 years of, of doing um, the work I do and also telling jokes and doing improv on a stage, I can tell you this. When you allow yourself to have fun and everybody can be playful, everybody can, you will generate some amazing, amazing ideas. So don't see fun as frivolity and oh, who needs it as a distraction. Uh-uh. When you're having fun, you are in your creative brain. You are using the best part of your brain. I promise you. I have a, another question about the complexity that we seem to have in the environment and in the in the workplace at Writer Access and how ideation is actually really hard with this platform and I think it's a shame and I'd like your thoughts on, on a few ideas I have. Let me explain to you the, the setup so you can understand it. So writers are, are working with customers and they're doing it inside of our platform, Kathy, and you know, our customers can find writers and place orders and manage the workflow. And usually when they're placing orders, they will dictate to the writer what they want to be created because that's the most efficient way to explain what you want and have the writer execute it for you so you can produce it and publish it and off you go. We allow writers, however, uh, often uh, uh, we, we, we facilitate an, an opportunity for a customer to uh, pitch ideas, for, to have the writer pitch ideas for a story or an article or a blog post or a white paper. And that tends to be very uh, one-dimensional in the sense that the writer sort of reads the creative brief and, and, and the description of, of, the, of the project and then comes back with one idea and, you know, hope you like it. I was wondering if you could imagine a different uh, ping pong match, I would call it, uh, where there could be some interaction, almost like live chat, where you could, uh, where, where a number of different writers could pitch ideas and, you know, maybe a yes and situation or, or, or crowdsource the, the ideas themselves with, with voting on those ideas or, uh, you know, use ideation as a way to uh, create a whole chain of ideas that could, uh, could come together. Could you ever imagine anything like that in a marketplace like ours? Yeah, actually, I think that's a great idea. It's really hard to to brainstorm when it's you're not talking to the person. I think it inhibits that yes, Andy, that can really change things. Um, I actually think a live pitch session um, could actually be really helpful for that. Um, you know, uh, if you enable that, or you had it some kind of interactive component with a video or Skype or something, um, I think that would help tremendously because I think you do lose something when. Um, you're not able to talk to the person. There's, there's something gets lost in translation. The, another question is regarding the, abandon, the abandonment of being playful. <laughs> why, do, why do we abandon being playful as we progress in our life and have more pressure on ourselves? What's, what's so wrong with being playful? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it took me a long time to get back to that playfulness self because corporate America likes to squeeze the playfulness out of it. And I always like to joke that it's only been in the last few years that I've finally become uh, the adult that my inner child would, would approve of. And um, I think my inner child will finally acknowledge in public that I, that I am the adult version of her. Um, I think it's part of it is two things. Um, we're told that, uh, you know, in a serious business environment, um, too often corporate culture um, looks at fun as, as not serious. And that's a mistake. That's, that's just a mistake. Um, fun is very powerful um, to the creative process. Um, I think the other part of it is, and you can find you can find corporate cultures that value fun, and that's the, the difference. You need to find a place that really, really makes fun okay because they understand how important it is. And I think the other thing is, is that um, somehow we get the message as we grow up that we have to be more serious. So, so between socialization and corporate America, and most people before they become entrepreneurs go through corporate America. 
um, they they sort of have gone through the um, unfun programming boot camp that I think corporate America makes everybody enroll in. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ever imagine producing for a, a, a brand what you might call a humor brand or in a, a uh, an improv uh, strategy that would lead you to uh, to a, you know to to an aim that you might have uh, for for being creative. Here's what I mean. If you look at that Red Bull ad that you uh, or that sort of uh, how Red Bull is is their brand is really aligned with extreme sports in in in, it, in particularly in that example that you showed. That's a brand position, don't you think? And it's executed brilliantly um, from a from a creative perspective, but 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 that's a that's a position. Do you, do you think that brands need those strategic positions and need to commit to that? Is that do you need an end goal uh, when, when you use improv to to, to be creative? You do need to know what your goal is. I mean, in the case of, of Red Bull, you're right. They, they know who their audience is, and they're very committed to that audience, and that helps because they know who they represent. And when you know who you represent, you know how to make your partner look good. So part of, yes, applying the principle means that you should know, but they also listen. And part of improv is listening to your audience. And if you listen to your audience, you're going to know who they are and what they want. But you should have an understanding of an end goal in mind. Here's, here's the thing. You can apply improv to anything, but you don't have to force an outcome. I think is maybe what you're asking, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you don't always have to know, gosh, going into using improv strategically, you know, you, there's no way to know, hey, I'm going to get this outcome. There's just no way to know. But that's true of any creative process. The main thing is you should know is, hey, what we do want as an outcome is this is our audience and we want to make their lives better. That's, that's why we're going to explore using improv techniques to come up with different ways of content, different ideas for products, all these different things. So you, sh you should sort of know who your audience is really deeply. Huh. I have lots more questions, but Kate, over to you. <laughs> hey. We've got uh, some wonderful audience questions coming in. In particular, uh, we're looking for some more B2B examples of how um, to make your audience look good, how to co-create, how to practice that partner engagement that you talked about, um, mostly with some B2C examples. So do you have any more great B2B um, examples or strategies for us, Kathy? Well, the make your partner look good is a really interesting one in B2B. It's a really great question because I haven't seen a whole lot. That doesn't mean they're not out there. I haven't seen and I'm constantly looking for new examples. But there are ways to do this. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, IBM uh, years ago started their Smarter Planet series. And part of what Smarter Planet, their campaign and their whole new thing in the world was, was about highlighting not themselves, but the fact that they enable all these other things in the world, smarter cities, smarter planets, more you know, green, sustainable practices. So they have tried to highlight partners. And here's what partners do with our products. It's not about us, but here's what our partners have been able to build. Salesforce, and this is a good question. Thank you for whoever asked it. It's a great one. Salesforce, because you've triggered my memory. Salesforce has, does a really good job on this as well. Salesforce, if you go to Dreamforce, um, and they do a little bit on their website, but they need, I, I'd like to see them go even further. Um, at Dreamforce, it's all about the people who get the spotlight, who tend to speak, are their partners. And it's all about, here's what our partners did with our content. Here's what our partners did, and here's how they look good, and here's and it's really, it's really putting the focus on that on the partners. Cisco's done a little bit of that. Um, it's not about Cisco products, you know. I'm sorry, Cisco, but nobody cares. It's about how those products were used by partners to make their partners look good, and they actually have done a few videos of that where they highlighted via interview. They interviewed. Um, like people, like a, C, a C, uh, CMO, a chief marketing officer, I think, from a, a beer, a beer company. <laughs> and they asked this person, you know, what do you do and how, how do you care about your customers? So it was never really about Cisco products. It was 
Cisco enables you to do what? And, and how do you make lives better for customers? And they actually did these on video, so you can go look that up on Cisco. So, um, great questions. The other thing that I will, example I'll give you is um, Marketo. Marketo did something really fun, and it wasn't necessarily about their partners, but, um, you know, sometimes, this is a good example of lightening, lightening up a little bit. Marketo a few years ago um, said, what's unexpected from us? Well, B2B enterprise software is very serious. So they actually created the uh, big activity book for adults. It's a coloring book and an activity book, and it was one of their most downloaded pieces of content ever. It's an activity book for adults. <laughs> I mean, it's insanely awesome. So, and it was super popular, and it it worked because it was about awareness and funnel building, and was heavily downloaded. So, those are some great examples, I think. Those are awesome, very helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, another B two B question: um, How how do you B two B and risk averse industries? How do you um, encourage those industries to embrace humor or um, you know improv comedy? Um, that is such a great question. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I you know I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> um, here, here's how I've done it. Here here's the the issue is. Um, I start internally, and so a lot of times B2B companies are so afraid of anything outside the firewall, the corporate firewall, right? They're so worried about, oh my gosh, our customer. And so one of the things that I always find is that the proof is in the results. So I've been able to um, come into to some companies and just show them internally with their employees hey, what do you have to lose? Let's do a brainstorming session. I'll bring some improv techniques out of my toolbox. Um, let's talk about some stuff, and let's just see where you are, how many ideas you end up with, and how jazzed the group is. And what I typically find is that when the results are there, if nothing else, um, B2B, we're, we're taught to look at analytics and results and data. Um, that is very low risk for them. So I would say that the, the, the biggest way to sell it is to make it a very low risk low table stakes kind of thing. Um, and usually what they find out is that not only are they getting better ideas and some fun ideas they never would have thought of with other tools, they're having fun. Their employees feel human. Their employees are like, oh my god, I'm, crea I'm creative and I didn't even know it. Yeah. I love that. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, an another uh, question about uh, humor and and what if your brand voice is more serious in nature? Um, mm -hmm. it, is the only way to incorporate your lessons to adjust the brand, or can you work it into a serious brand voice but still push those boundaries a little bit? I think the latter, yeah. I think the latter. You can do it for a serious brand voice because re fun is not at odds with a serious brand voice. It really isn't. I mean, look at Marketo in their, their, their lighthearted coloring book for adults. Um, uh, look at LinkedIn. It's a business tool, but you know they've done some very funny things with their videos of kids reading resumes. Um, how, why the thing that that I think we need to be asking not is it is it because it's not at odds. It's how can I use fun to make a point that's relevant to my brand voice. That's the question we need to ask. In the case of LinkedIn, well, having kids poke fun at their parents' resume is is brilliant and it's relevant because it says look. LinkedIn is a great tool, but it's only as powerful as your profile. So if your profile ain't working for you, you need to make it work for you. So I, I think it's a it fits into the brand voice of LinkedIn as a serious business tool. Hmm. Um, that's, so that's really practical. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, do you have some examples um, of using improv or improv company strategies in fundraising copy? Um, in fundraising, I think, um, I have, I, you know, I would say that, yes, I think what the byproduct of what the Humane Society did, because they are a uh, nonprofit, um, yeah. uh, they, the byproduct of that whole campaign around Eddie the Terrible was that it not only, it, it raised their level of awareness, but it raised donations, it raised activism, it raised advocacy. People wanted to actually advocate on their behalf. And they galvanized millennials to actually help get some of these pets adopted. So um, I, I don't have a specific example that I can cite, but I think that 
they did use the principles of improv comedy, which was uh, to, to have fun, to lighten up, to tell the truth, and to be playful. And I think in that sense, they, they absolutely did a great job putting into practice the, the principles of improv comedy. That's great. I'm just going to uh, spit two more questions at you, if that works, if you, if you that, can. That does. And, and also, also can, I, can I really quickly, before I forget, Kate, can I also... Yes. I am looking at my books that I'm writing on storytelling examples. If anybody listening has an example from their company or, or something that they thought was very compelling in the business space, um, by all means, please email me about it. Um, uh, we're looking for case studies for my book. So, Kathy at keepingithuman.com. All right, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll put, I'll put your email address in the chat box for everybody. And we do have it up on the slide as well. So, um, please do send some, some stories to um, Kathy. That would be uh, uh, very helpful. We'd love to support her and, and as a thank you for your, for your time today. Um, so, a quick question is, where or when would we be able to see that credit union video that you mentioned? Well, I hope soon. I hope soon. It's going through, <laughs> it's going, it's going through a few of the, uh, the hurdles that happen inside of uh, companies because credit unions is, is uh, in such a great question. Uh, much to my dismay, um, regulated industries tend to uh, sometimes work a little slower. Uh, but um, there are other examples of great credit unions out there besides that that have used, um, and unfortunately there's one that I am, I'm totally blanking on that I just saw the other day where they used millennials and it was very funny um, but I would say uh, you know you can google credit unions millennials and humor and there are some actually very interesting things that pop up um, hopefully this one that I'm that I was a part of will, will be up sooner rather than later but it is a regulated cool. industry and you know there you go <laughs> yeah, <it> challenges <laughs> yeah well, we'll keep our eyes out for that. Um, my last question for you goes back to the yes and principle that you uh, demonstrated yeah. for us. Um, and we are asked, you know, when improvising content and yes anding each other and not yes butting, how do you center or sift through the ideas that get generated to determine which are best to use. So if you're saying yes and building off everything, you know, some ultimately have more value than others. So how do you sift right. uh, once right. you have all those ideas? Well it would be it would that's a great question. It's the say it's no different from any brain brainstorming tool you use. Um, I, I, regardless of whatever methodology you use to brainstorm, you're going to get ideas, some of which are eh, and some of which are like eh, meh, and some of which are yeah, right on. So <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's the same exact thing. So what, what I would do is just part of why we yes and is so that we're not filtering and killing our creativity. We're not killing it. So yeah. here's my recommendation. Yes and it takes the first five minutes for everybody to warm up. So yes and each other for you know 10, 15 minutes or break your team up into small groups and then come back and do a big yes and. And do this for 15, 20 minutes. Get all the ideas on the table, okay? Then look at all the ideas and say, ah, understand that some of them aren't gonna be viable. Then hone in on the ones that you think are. You know, in the idea with, you know, the idea generation part with Byron. Yeah, some of them aren't, aren't gonna work, but you know, if I am a smart device manufacturer, well, part of what I can do is help people um, be smarter about how to use their phone when they're traveling. So yeah, I wanna know where hockey rinks are and great ones that have great food. That's, a, that's actually a practical, that's a practical thing. I'm not gonna necessarily design creative content or design anything around a camera you can swallow as a hockey puck, but that's not the point, that's not the point. So get the ideas on the table and then ask yourself, A, does it advance our goals? Does it match with the company's story? Does it help, and, and B, does it help customers? Is it fresh? Is it different? Is it fun? Does it help customers? And th use those two criteria for narrowing down. That's wonderful. And I think this is a good place to uh, wrap it up. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we had such a great interactive um, crew here. Thank Yay! you. For, <laughs> yeah, th thank you for sharing your expertise with us and suffering through uh, technology issues. No yeah. matter how much you practice, you never know what to expect. <laughs> no, but, for yeah. yeah, we appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you for advancing my slides. And do stay in touch, everybody. <laughs> um, you know, you can reach yeah. me at Kathy at keepingithuman.com and at Kathy Clotes Guest on Twitter. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Byron, for your insightful questions. They really uh, helped <clears throat> open the conversation up. So we were glad to have you here as well, very much so.
more questions where that came from, but I'm back to tech <laughs> talk here at Ad Tech on. Thanks again, Kathy. <laughs> My pleasure, and, Mark. Uh, we can talk later. <laughs> we can tech talk later. There you go. <laughs> we'll talk uh, about hockey us. pucks too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Yeah, thank you. Uh, join us next month. Um, you can visit writeraccess.com slash webinar every month to um, uh, brush up on your content marketing knowledge with new strategies and ideas. So we'll uh, hopefully see you in December. Bye. Bye.